Okay. Hi, guys. Welcome to Starting Over in America. And thank you all for coming to the Museum of the Moving Image. Today's program is part of our ongoing Science on Screen series, in which we explore everything from seahorses to robots, bringing scientists and filmmakers to the museum. Oh, sure. A little louder on the mic, if you don't mind. Thank you. OK. So Science on Screen is a nationwide initiative of the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation, supported by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. The Sloan Foundation is a nonprofit philanthropy founded in 1934 that makes grants in research and broad-based education in science, technology, and economics. My name is Sonia Epstein. I am the curator of this series and executive editor of the museum's website, scienceandfilm.org. I am very excited to be showing tonight John Frankenheimer's 1966 film Seconds. Seconds is the third in Frankenheimer's so-called Paranoia trilogy that began with The Manchurian Candidate in 1962 and also includes Seven Days in May, which he made in 1964. Seconds plays out one version of the American dream, as you will soon see. So with us tonight, we are very lucky to have Derek Hamilton here. He is a professor of economics and urban policy at the New School. Derek was named one of the Politico 50, a list of 50 people and ideas blowing up American politics for his proposal for a federal job guarantee program, which would provide the opportunity of full employment to everyone. Derek is the past president of the National Economic Association, and in addition to his new school appointments, is an associate director of the Social Equity Center at Duke University. I'm excited to say that we also have Michael Atkinson here with us. Michael is a critic, poet, and essayist who has authored several books and contributes regularly to The Village Voice and The New York Times, including writing about Frankenheimer's films. So after seconds, we'll be discussing the possibilities and limitations of the American dream. I urge all of you to stick around if you can. Um, so now here is seconds. All right. So, so Derek, um, I'm going to start with you. Okay. And uh, having just seen this film, um, I guess my first question would be uh, wanting to know what your response is to the, the general viability of a company that sells second chances. <laughs> and just to follow up, I'm asking this in part because you have this proposal for a federal job guarantee program. So. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what you think a job provides a person and why you think it's important for, yeah, anyway, I'll let you take it away. That's an easy question, huh? <laughs> no, there, there were lots of metaphors uh, directed at capitalism and capital. I think the old man represented capitalism. He, he started out with really good intentions, um, but he said he got caught up in the corporate structure and uh, just started to be routine. Uh, I mean, you could see from the delivery of the, the body was delivered in a meat truck. I think that that was telling as well. Uh, clearly throughout the film, there was this notion of choice. Um, and uh, I guess throughout the, in, throughout the process of converting the individual, it was, did he really have choice? He was manipulated literally with uh, drugs, but yet somehow the decision seemed to be his that the old man's big task was making the decision seem as though it was his. So, you know, I think that that really is an overture towards uh, capitalism and, and uh, I guess the, how we're beholden to corporate interests. I mean, and then ultimately it was to be released, he had to find another person. So the, the exchange was he really sold himself. Um, so, and ultimately he, he didn't find someone else, so he died. So then you asked how that might tie in with a federal job guarantee. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, my colleagues and I, a few of us have been talking about a federal job guarantee, and I'm happy to report that it's no longer something that's viewed as a fringe idea, but rather it's a bold idea. Uh, the papers, in, uh, Washington Post just covered an article on it. Uh, Bernie Sanders came out, is coming out with a proposal about a federal job guarantee. Um, and then uh, some other senators, Cory Booker, uh, Senator Gillibrand, as well as one more, uh, Jeff Merkel, 
they're talking about a demonstration of a federal job guarantee. So I say this to say it's not a fringe idea. And when Americans are polled about it, they, a majority of Americans support it. And they support it even when it's framed as, would you be willing to have a 5% tax imposed in order to guarantee every American a job? So uh, a majority, it, it polls not only with a majority of Americans, but given our electoral college system, every state there's a 50% majority for it. So, so that, I just want to mention, it's not pie in the sky, um, but how does it fit in with the long-winded answer to get to the point of the question? It fits in with the film in that we intend for it to be a competitive alternative to, um, I guess, uh, the current jobs. So uh, basically, it would be a public option, a right to work with dignity. Now, of course, individuals don't need, your dignity is not defined by your job. But on the other hand, there is dignity in work, work that, that is, is useful, that is aimed at, at uh, delivering useful products, but also has a decent wage so that, you know, right now, 44% of the homeless population works. So a job that really gives someone decent wages and decent benefits, but ultimately provides a competitive alternative to, uh, I guess, the private sector. Hmm. <laughs> um, I, the only response I had to that, I mean, I'm not, you know, in terms of dovetailing what's in the movie, I'm sure you know that there's three of the main characters in the film were played by blacklisted actors. Uh, Jeff Corey, Will Gear, and John Randolph. Um, they weren't necessarily blacklisted anymore, of course, in 1966, but it seemed interesting. Frankenheimer, who was a uh, diehard lefty, had kind of surrounded the main character, you know, with the, uh, played by a gay actor who has shifting identities, um, in the, you know, and is subject to, you know, the corporation's uh, machinations. Um, but surrounding them, surrounding him with, um, I don't know, the, the, these, this phalanx of, of reds, ostensibly. I don't, you know, I don't know how that might interplay with anything that you were thinking. Oh, I mean, I think it fits in very well. I mean, there's also that theme of identity, which you, you mm. kind of shed light on. And, uh, you know, th this would change the subject a little bit if I go in this direction. In economics, we talk about... Uh, it, and it fits, a lot of my work is about discrimination and uh, uh, discrimination along gender lines, racial lines. And I'd say a limitation of my field in economics is that we simply treat identity as something that's given or predetermined. Mm -hmm. So there's no room for discrimination in economics because if you're a bigoted firm that has a taste for discrimination, that means you prefer one worker identity over another worker's identity, but the market should bid you out of business over time because that's something that, that is um, basically a taste that's not productivity linked or profit linked. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, given this, what, what we try to bring in in our analysis is a notion that identity is something that individuals can choose, and given the context, you might invest in that identity. So therefore, as opposed to just treating something like discrimination as some bigoted taste or preference, that individuals will invest in, that, in an identity like whiteness if there's an economic return to it. And hence you get the notion from critical race theorists and stratification economists of a property right in whiteness. The fact that whites are twice as likely to be employed at every le uh, have half the unemployment rate as blacks at every level of, of education is indicative of a property right in whiteness. So, the, you know, so one might ask, why not, why wouldn't, if, if you know, I said that identity is something people can choose in, choose, so, women and black men or black women, to some extent, they can adopt identities that might be rewarded more in the labor market. So suppose women were to adopt male characteristics if we have structures with, that reward women in the labor market for maleness. Well, what is the constraint on them? I think it was evident in, the, in that film that there's some cognitive dissonance, that there is a psychological cost of being something that you're not. So why won't all blacks try to act like white people in order to get rewarded if, if that's the structure? Hmm. Well, dissonance, being something that you're not. Yeah, one of, one of the things I was gonna bring up is that um, in the film, as I'm sure you noticed, all of the reborns are white, you know, middle-aged men probably, you know, wealthy given that, uh, as they said, the cost of a second life is $30,000 and that was in 1966. Um, so I was gonna ask actually Michael, but it could be both, you know, sort of what, uh, 
what you make of that, if anything, given, you know, Frankenheimer's. Uh, um, well, I mean, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure about the the economic aspect of it, obviously then, well, therefore, obviously, given the, the price of it in the context of the story, only certain people, you know, had the, um, had the economic a access to this, you know, very shady and very um, questionable, um, you know, opportunity to swap out their identities, um, which the movie, I think, makes really clear just is not a good, not necessarily a good idea. It's almost has a slightly probably unintentional conservative edge, mm -hmm. you know, especially mm -hmm. from, you know, our perspective today where we look at something like identity as something that's morphable and changeable and swappable and, you know, nobody else outside of ourselves has the right to pin it down for us. Um, and this movie is saying that, you know, sure, here's a, here's a hypothetical, you know, quasi-futuristic situation where you know, a corporate structure will allow you to pay for a new identity and, and yet, time and time again, obviously, given the structure of the, the company, it doesn't work. Um, which is kind of the, it's the American dream. It's the dark side of the American dream. It's the, it's, which is the capitalist, you know, obviously, um, idea that you have, if you have enough money, you can buy anything, including a new self. And that's, I think that's kind of the, I guess, the left side of that argument from Frank and Amber's perspective, uh, as he's looking at it saying, yeah, you can't really. Um, but... Yeah, so, um, hmm. yeah, that's interesting. Um, there's one moment that also following on that sort of stuck with me from the film, which is that when Tony Wilson goes back home to Scarsdale and visits um, Arthur Hamilton's wife, she has this quote saying that, you know, basically he spent his life fighting hard for what he was taught he wanted. And then um, Tony Wilson has a similar line at the end. Um, so I think, you know, just to put a point on that, I was wondering, you know, what, what version you guys see, both to Derek and Michael, of the American dream uh, in the film? You know, is it, uh, uh, I guess, given that this was made in 1966, you know, do, is, it, is it this idea of, hmm. you know, just being wealthy and being able to do what you want um, and not, have, not, not having any responsibilities or, and maybe how that idea of the American dream has changed? Right. Now, it's a broad question, but. I mean, there was a clear message in the film. In the film uh, love people, not things. I mean, I think that came across. And, and he tried, he, he realized it at the end, and he wanted to buy back into it. But at that point, he had sold his soul. It was too late. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I, can, all right, I guess my, my take on it was, is a little bit more uh, existential. Um, you know, and, it, and it's just like, and it's, and it's funny, just like a, any kind of good piece of existentialist fiction, it is kind of universal and at the same time very specific of its day and age. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, looking at this film recently and thinking about it, it's like, it seems to be, to me, to be absolutely emblematic, maybe the emblematic film of the, the post-Eisenhower era, you know, of the, of the 60s, uh, where you have what, what the film is kind of imbued with throughout the structure of its plot is the, a deep disenchantment with everything that uh, Americans were supposed to be working for. Uh, and, that, and not just identity, but all the things that we were told make up that identity. Um, you know, the main character, before he switched, he didn't have, he, would, he didn't want for anything. Um, you know, he didn't want for, he didn't seem to want for anything, at least by our, you know, our, or the, the mass kind of idea of what, what you should have and, you know, and, and how hard you should work for it and what success is. Um, but, you know, it failed him. The system failed him. Um, and then it failed him again. Um, and the system I mean then is not the company, but the larger system. The company just seems to be this, I guess, kind of new capitalist manifestation of the larger impulses uh, of capitalism around the character. Uh, so it's, therefore, it's almost destined to fail him. Um, and of course, the, you know, the, what we see in the movie is, you know, people working for the company, they're used to it. They see this all the time. They are literally just recycling people, um, you know, because they're all expendable at this point. Like the cows. <laughs> like what? Like the cows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good used cows, whatever it says. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, Were you gonna... the, the, walk through the, the walk through the slaughterhouse, you know. Uh, was not an accident. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was going through routines. At the end, when he was talking about the letter in return to the, 
the loan application when he said, et cetera, et cetera. At that point, he was devoid of emotion, just really mechanized and routine. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Derek, I also want to be sure to ask you, um, you have this idea also for baby bonds. Um, so, you know, I would ask, you know, basically for whom do you see second chances being possible for, you know, and, and how your idea is sort of trying to, to challenge that. Sonia, you set me up so well to talk about all my ideas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I didn't know I'd get to talk about baby bonds today, but it does fit, I guess. Um, so we have this other plan called baby bonds, and basically that's child trust accounts at birth for everyone. In our estimation, the source of inequality is some young adults have access to some seed capital at a key point in their life that allows them to invest in a home, a new business, a debt-free education, some asset that will appreciate over their life passively. And some Americans simply don't. So basically, in our capitalist system, if you lack capital, all that does is lock in inequality. So child trust accounts, based on the family position that you're born in, would give everyone access to this endowment so that they could passively grow their assets over time. So, you know, the film had a lot of themes about choice and freedom. If I was to define the paramount indicator of financial agency, that would be wealth. And um, again, if we look at wealth inequality in the U.S., it's dramatic. If we look at the racial wealth gap, it's even more dramatic. Race becomes a stronger predictor of somebody's wealth position than class itself. So baby bonds is really intended to give everybody some financial agency or financial choice because most Americans don't engage in active savings, but rather their wealth is generated in a passive way. Um, okay, so I want to see if anybody has any questions. We have a little bit of time. Okay, in the front, yeah. Uh, it's a boring question, but uh, do you have an idea of how much uh, 30000 in 1966 would be today? I looked it up. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. Oh, you did too? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Good thing. Uh, no, I, I figured I was going to be the boring economist, so I, I think the present value would be about $230,000. I got the same. <laughs> yeah, the row back there. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if saw any similarities to Miracle on 34th Street, which was like in 1946, and they're talking about the commercialization of Christmas, and this is like right after World War II, before, like when it just started, and how it's already knocking materialism, how all these, like, we, did, we, did, we only thought it was today that a lot of these movies are criticizing kind of the American dream, but it kind of, it happened pretty early, like it was like 20 years before this movie, so if you saw, if you guys saw that movie. Well, that of course. <laughs> He's asking um, about Miracle on 34th Street, for those who didn't hear yeah, the question. It, Miracle on 34th Street has a kind of a mixed anti-capitalist message, though, because in the end, everyone gets what they want anyway. Um, be better to look at, actually, also another movie with a kind of a mixed message is um, it's, a life. it's a Wonderful Life, um, which, you know, it, which, which, I mean, it's actually practically a socialist movie, um, which, of course, ends up in a pile of cash. You know, in in the hero's uh, in the hero's home, but the cash itself is almost meaningless. No one seems to work for it. It does. It's just kind of like because he's a nice guy, it just rains out of the sky practically. Or you know, it comes from the 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 goodwill that he's earned in the community over his lifetime. Um, so it doesn't really fit into the capitalist model. Uh, when the whole film before that, of course, for two hours, is telling us. Um, you know, how, how everyone should be pulling together and building each other's homes and financing each other's homes. And that's the way the system should work and people are happy that way. And, uh, you know, then you have Mr. Potter. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, anti-capitalist in that movie, I think definitely. Um, anti-materialist, I don't know. Maybe one more. Yeah, Jackie. Well, the movie it reminded me of was Get Out, which I yeah. think is... A, a second chance for those who can afford it, and some people are expendable to make that happen. That's true. Nicely put. Yeah, As the whole second chances, and and uh, from from st rich white people, you know. I, I mean, I ended up watching the movie three times because I don't typically delve in film, so I I wanted to be prepared. And it was the third time sitting in the audience, the same thing struck me that it was really like get out um, because. He, he didn't have control of his body. He, he, 
All right, he, he had, um, once he made that deal and made, signed his signature, he lost control and somebody else manipulated his whole lifestyle. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> Maybe one more, if, if there is, yeah. Well, for all the talk about capitalism, what seems to strike me most is the idea of, F. Scott Fitzgerald said, there are no second acts in American lives. And some would say that's because we never get over our first act. We're too busy reinventing ourselves constantly over here. And it would seem for all the talk about money, it's the fact that there isn't anything in Arthur Hamilton that he can look to beyond the memory of the tennis game and when he was the, 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 the eternal champion. And that, while that's considered, it's obvious we can't make a, t a tennis pro out of a man who's 51 years old despite the thing there. Right. And I think the idea of what struck me always seems like for all the fascinating talk about economics in here is the notion that you have to have a dream. Right. These people don't have a dream. My view, for instance, when Charlie disappears, I think he's cadaver procurement. I don't think they have a second thing because if you can come up with somebody else when he give you another chance, or why you would think, do you think I'm yeah. lucky? Oh no, I, th I think that's the, the waiting room, the day room. I think they're all waiting to, for the, you know, somebody to come in, somebody that would be enlisted by a friend perhaps, and therefore then they need a corpse. And they pick from whoever's waiting. Um, but no, I think that's, I, that's why I kind of brought up the whole existentialist thing before, um, because it does seem like he was, he's a, he was an empty vessel. Um, and, and that's kind of why he was susceptible and vulnerable to this, this opportunity, um, despite the fact that he had everything. You know, he had everything that money could buy, you know, and it didn't, it didn't seem to do it. It seemed like, but, and, but I think the film is suggesting it's not so much a spiritual emptiness, but literally, you know, having worked or 40 years or whatever within the system that promised him fulfillment and suddenly turned around and, and there was none. We gave him everything, it wasn't what he wanted. Yeah. <laughs> but by the end, I think he'd come to the realization that he should have loved the people in his life the first time. He, he started, it seemed to me that, um, he started to have nostalgia for his, his, uh, his daughter, his nephew, um, and then even when he saw his wife, there was a, a little bit of, of endearment. And, you know, again, for me, the, the big message was love people, not things. Unfortunately, he learned that too late. In the book, we actually meet the son-in-law. I think I'm just going to, and I, I, would, I just think it might be interesting to hear, Michael, maybe you can talk about how the film was received uh, when it first premiered in 1966. I was anticipating that question, and I forgot to look it up. But I, oh, I mean, in terms, I can, in terms of, <laughs> you know, like actual how much money it made or anything like that. But, but it was, I mean, look at this movie. This movie is not, you know, what people were audiences in the year of like The Sound of Music were really interested in, in seeing. Um, it's, a, it's, a one, it's a wonder of this era of American movies from the late 60s to the 70s that there were so many unbelievably dark movies, movies that could never be made today, um, that had you know, Hollywood stars walking in and they had studios making them, and um, despite the fact that their potential for finding a large audience was really small. You know, even Rock Hudson fans, or maybe especially Rock Hudson fans. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, we have to finish, um, but, but please uh, join me in thanking Michael Atkinson, Derek Hamilton, and thank all of you for coming. And I, I just wanna say um, that uh, I can say that the next Science on Screen event, in case you're interested, will be on June 10th, and it will be the first US screening of Agnieszka Holland's new film, Spore. Um, about a woman living in a small village on the Czech-Polish border. It's run by hunters, and she decides to sort of give voice to the animals and uh, take action. So we'll be talking about the relationship of humans to animals. So thank you again so much for coming. Thank you.